and good evening. It's February 20th, 2024, and we're in our next collection of discussions in our Outside the Class series. It's another series from Tim Mackey. It's called Eat This Book, just because it sounded fascinating to me from the start. So on the dustyfeet.com, in the Outside the Class section, we have the Eat This Book source video section set up for review. Because the purpose of Outside the Class is for you to listen to the, to the in-class lectures first. Go listen to Tim. But those are only going to be found in the source video playlist. Because with this way of doing things, you can watch the video before we begin chatting. We still keep to hope we still hope to keep these to around 15 to 20 minutes or so. Because we want to make them easy to catch and easier to catch up on. So we're going to continue our Eat This Book series with The Call to Sacrifice, and this is part two of three on Outside the Class, on the Dusty Feet. And before we forget, if you find these kinds of podcasts useful, that's when you click the subscribe button. The reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, that's when you click that like button, because that is the way that YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. So eat this book, The Call to Sacrifice, part two. So I might suggest that we reconsider the thought that we are very much in the story. We are connected to it. We are an ongoing part of it. Because if we're followers of this God, the one at the tent of meeting, and this entire collection of scrolls is about the followers of this God, and that then the story's not finished. It's not all been accomplished, so then I suggest that we are very much a part of it. We are in this story. You know, and since I began to stretch, to shift, to change my paradigm perspective on this, I've viewed them differently too. I look at them and I see myself, ourselves, my feet in their sandals, and I more and more identify with them. When we hear about what they've done, I look, I notice, like one, right, that they're only doing what they know, two, that they're trying, and three, that, like us, sometimes they don't pay attention and get themselves into trouble. Sound like anybody we know? I chuckle with the uncanny similarities, even with the cultural divide, yeah? They left Egypt, no doubt about that, they left in a hurry, not without goods for sure, they gathered up what they had, what they were given, and they left. Yet it seems that in that move, it seems that they brought the trash with them as well. As most of you know, I'm retired U.S. Air Force 20 years, and during those years, we moved six times. I know many folks who moved more than that in 20 years. But I remember folks who had been in for years before us, and they were helping us in our moves to give us little bits of advice. Here's one of them. Hide the trash. Hide the trash when the movers come. When the packers come to crate up your belongings, and yes, in my time, it was literally very large crates, to make sure that your trash was hidden or locked up. Because the stories passed down to those folks that had left their trash out while preparing and the packers had put them in boxes, put them in the crate, locked them up and sealed them. I think you can see where I'm going with this, but I'm going to add a bit to the fun. Because in all of my moves, they were all transcontinental. From one country across the ocean to the other, they were in those crates a long time. I know many others had the same. I will say that we were very fortunate with only some, uh, we only got lucky. We had some paper trash and some unwanted items that were packed up. We were unaware. But the stories that were shared to me that helped me not to let my kitchen trash end up there, well, <laughs> you, can, you can guess that picture. So Tim brought up the point that they had brought what they knew, that trash, they brought it with them, those practices. They had learned that stuff. They had lived that stuff. They had suffered through that stuff. 
And I'll agree, the stuff that needed not be packed up need to be left behind. Yet, like us, we bring stuff. And later on, we ask ourselves, why did we pack this? Why did we bring this? We just should have left it behind or thrown it away. You know, I've got a feeling that much of what we do, they, uh, they pack it up. Like we also do in our heads and carried it with us. Wait, wait, we're talking about them. So at times, things that we might read about and get on a bit of a high horse and say, how could they do that? Well, I've moved enough to know that it's easier than we even care to admit. But it's in the response that grabs me the most. I fully understand and can identify with the egregious behavior. I fit well in sandals very nicely. But I want to see the, re the response, right? How do we respond to our poor choice? Now, now we can see how easily and important it is for us to understand this part of Leviticus. Because we're learning that there is a response. And it's an action that God expects. And like anything with God, our choices, if poor, will have a consequence and a cost. Leviticus is going to help us with that. Hopefully, we're going to really start to grasp that. Because the example at the beginning of Leviticus, it shows us as a young bull, that there's so much more to this. This is just the beginning. But the one bringing the offering, he places his hand on the head of the animal, this young bull, and offers it as atonement, that it will be an acceptable atonement. In this example, we don't yet really hear of a confession yet, but, but it was spoken that the sacrifice was found to be acceptable, one that would need to be acknowledged that the sin, this is why I'm bringing this to the altar, this is why I need to bring this to you. So yes, I agree with Tim. Confession's very much an element of the sacrifice. So here's an interesting thought to consider, and one that's not really addressed here. It's real for me. Whom is the sacrifice for? Is it only the man? Is it for his wife too? The children? Because if there's an element of confession here, that evens up more <laughs> of, a, of a thing with family and community dynamics, yeah? Because I'm not stretching far here. Really, I'm not. I'm going to give you an example. Yet I'm going to need to go Go backwards a bit. I need to reference a man that interested me since I picked up a Bible. Okay, well, I sect about two people, didn't I? Jonah and Job. And it's to Job that I want to take reference for this consideration. It's from Job, chapter 1. Just read the first five verses, right? And there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. In his possessions, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. That man was the greatest of all men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each on his day, right? They would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of feasting had come and they'd completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them. He'd rise up early in the morning, offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. And Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. So it seems that maybe we have a family element and even a communal element to consider. It's going to stretch us a bit. Remember, these are not young children. These are men and women. Still, they are the children of Job, and Job cares. And he approaches God's through sacrifice with his concern. 
So the example that Tim shows with his stuffed lamb, that's the traditional element, and the confession, the hand on the head, the transfer of the guilt of the transgression to be past the animal. So the garbage is going to where it needs to be taken care of. I will suggest that there is a difference here that I kind of want to make clear. This sacrifice, it's not a trash can, a, a place where garbage belongs. Really, it's quite the opposite. It's placed there because we have garbage that we have not disposed of properly, and now it has to be dealt with. We need this to clean up the garbage. Because this animal, it's blameless. It does not deserve this in any way, shape, or form. It is us who needs our garbage cleaned up and taken care of. The, the expense of another. Tim's picture, the when he's showing the stuffed animal and the knife, it's not messy. It's not really dramatic. Yet his words, the visual picture, it's very clear. As you watch, the animal's throat is cut. The blood drains out into a bowl. Who knows? Maybe many bowls. And you watch the life drain out of the animal, watching its last breath. I found, uh, I found Tim's point with the crowd. His knife pointing was unintentional. It was quite a thought to consider. Because if you knew that the actions that you did would eventually lead to the event that we just talked about, would that have an effect on your actions in the future? Would we, knowing that this is but one of the costs of our behavior, would we think twice? I think we'd like to say yes, and yet I, I agree with Tim. <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure even today that we would think again. Because even in this, and Tim kind of brushes over it a bit, not sure if it's intentional, because I know he has a story that he's sharing. Yet, even in this, God does have, even here, a redemptive value and, uh, and concern from this innocent death, right? It's, it's death will do more. Because it's death. It, it offers an aroma to God, a soothing aroma to God. It's meat, as we'll read later, with the exception of just a few, will be taken and eaten by the priests and their families. These people that are called into service. Not because they're anything special, not because they're so righteous, but because they're the lineage of Levi. That's an interesting part of the story that I suggest you dig into someday. Aaron is from that tribe. Yes, and that would be Moses as well, yeah? This and his lineage, because they, they're not given ownership in, in the land of, of Israel, yeah? They are not given property to claim. They don't get land to work. They live to serve, to be servants to the Most High, to be, to be part of this sacrifice. They are a part. They have to see this too. They are impacted as well. I think about at times what it meant to be a priest to, to serve like this. Because in today's world, our sacrificeless, bloodless world, for the large majority of us, we don't see or feel this cost. We don't even see normal death with our animals, right? Except maybe on YouTube. Unless maybe you have the experience of living on or being part of a farm that slaughtered its own. Because this is something that I can honestly say that I do recommend that people experience. Because it's going to bring context to so much, from what we eat every day to a, a different way to look at how one frames the sacrifices, the, the feeling of the cost. Because yes, there are good elements, even in this death. That's just a part. 
Yet it's the blood that's only for God. It is his to have sprinkled on the altar to show the mark, right? After what's left is burned up or eaten, there's the blood. We have a reference to blood in Genesis. It's in response to Abel after Cain kills him, right? Genesis 4, right? He, God, said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. The blood cries out. Unjustly shed blood. It cries out to God. We get reference to it in other places in Scripture as well, yeah? Yet here, in this space, with God's instructions, this is a a set-apart place, a holy place, a place where maybe, it's a thought that rolls around in my head and in my heart, at this blood, it, it'll tell a different tale. I'm not sure about good, but I do lean towards that God cares and God's justice will prevail. Atonement equals Kippur, right? Hence where we get Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement, equals to cover over, to pay a ransom. To cover over does not deny that it exists. It does not remove it. It will not prevent the consequences that arise from it. But it does cover it from being seen, as in the focus, in the eye of God. It's not seen by him again. And the cost, it does redeem the indebtedness of the giver to God. There's a price as well, and that debt's paid. But again, it does not remove the consequence, at least the earthly consequence. These animals die. They do not continue. There's no life that continues from them. Their lineage ends. Still a consequence. I did like the breakdown of the English word used to translate Kippur, right? Because let's remember, this is not the original word. It's the text we chosen to express Kippur in Hebrew, okay? Atonement. Tim called the at one mint, right? Because it's an old English word, like Shakespearean times, right? Uh, remember, this is driven from King James. Yet, I do like what it expressed, that two parties were at one, right? The, the resolution of the matter, that the conflict or the rift that's there, and there's something that works to repair that, the uh, at one mint, the atonement. So that atonement, it will cover over, repair the rift, or repair the matter. Tim uses a very current use of the phrase. I like this, I'll cover you, I'll cover that. We use it by far most often when we're out to eat, and we'll be paying the entire, uh, the debt of the meal. I'll cover that. I got this. Because the debt is real, and it has to be paid, but instead of your part being covered by yourself, it's covered by another. Simple, yet profound. Tim brings up a good point, one that, that even on the surface is going to cause more than one question. But let's go with this example. Why does God require this? Why, why can't God just forgive? Why the cost? And in this solution, it seems a bit uh, a term we like to use barbaric with the sacrifice, and yet it's very clearly set in the cultural constructs of the day, the, the day that those kinds of activities are happening. Because the Bible is building a view of, of human choices, of human sin, of human consequences, and the cost that those choices bring upon humanity and creation as a whole, right? Innocents are involved. Maybe, maybe because today we don't see blood, maybe we've lost that connection. 
So next week, we're going to continue this thought and we'll see where it goes. Because there's more to consider. There's going to be more to connect. So, and we're going to wrap up this section of the call to sacrifice on Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet.